Hey guys, how's it going? So let's talk early game in Manor Lord. Today the embargo is lifted for us content creators and we can start putting out videos and everybody's going to have Let's Plays out. But I want to talk about some tips and tricks and guides to help you get started when the game releases to the public later this month. So with that out of the way, let's jump in and talk about some of the stuff about the game that's going to help you. So first of all, let's talk about the settings for your game setup. There are a couple of scenario templates up here that you can do. These just give you default settings and everything, but I do recommend going down here and playing around with some of the goals. Your end goal doesn't really matter because as soon as you reach whatever the goal is, you can still play continuously. So you can set this to something like growth, conquest where you need to claim all the regions, or none, which is endless play, all of those right there are basically however you want to play. But again, once you achieve a goal, you can still keep playing. So it doesn't really matter. Your AI opponents, this right here is turned off at the moment, but later on, this will be in effect. Off map adversary is basically, it adds an AI opponent that is located off of the map. He won't build any settlements or anything else. He just controls a couple of regions and he will bring soldiers into the game map when he's challenged by either you or the bandits on the map if they are existing. The AI aggressiveness is very simple, either reactive, they won't try to claim other regions, but they will defend their own. So if you go try to claim a region from a rival AI, they will protect that, but they will not come after you. The balanced aggressiveness means that the AI will only come after your regions after they've run out of neutral regions to claim. So it gives you a little bit of breathing room, but still puts you on the clock about how you're going to have to defend yourself or go on the offense. And aggressive means that the AI is going to come at you uh, whenever it wants, and it will just start attacking you at any given point. So you're going to have to be really quick on building up your military and defending yourself. Raiders are random bands of bandits that will come in off of the map to attack you on occasion. You either can set this to no raids, medium raids, no more than a single raid every two years, or frequent, and there's possibly less than a year between each raid. If you have Raider Frequency turned on, you could also set the number of years that Raiders will not happen. You can either set that to one year, so raids start to happen after one year in game, two years, three years, four years, five years. So you can determine how many years you have without having to worry about Raiders coming in off the map. From my experience, the Raiders start with an initial group of maybe three to four groups of melee infantry, and they can get some more stuff later on. Bandit camps can be set to either not appear at all, or you can have the initial bandit camps set from one to five. So these are the bandit camps that will show up on the map. Again, either none at the start of the game or one to five bandit camps can be present when the game starts. You can also set a random bandit camp spawn limit so no spawns at all. So if you set this to five and zero, that means you'd have five bandit camps you could go and claim, and then no more will ever spawn. You can also set this to have either up to three already spawning or five already spawning. So it just depends on how many bandit camps you want to deal with. Your starting season right here, you can change this from either spring, summer, fall, or winter. Spring is the default and it's just the best time to start. Uh, it gives you plenty of time to uh, begin building everything up and setting your housing and getting your people housed. If you want a really big challenge, you can set this to fall or even winter where you need to get houses built immediately to get your people housed before they freeze to death. Starting supplies can be either set to a standard amount of starting supplies double the normal amount no starting supplies so it just depends on how difficult you want to make it for yourself armament delivery is actually really really cool you could either have this set to no free weaponry delivery or once you have built a storehouse and five residential plots you will get a shipment of 20 spears and 20 large shields this lets you get a 20 stack spearman militia up at the very beginning of the game just about so you already have a force to defend yourself with and go after bandits residential requirements are uh, balanced so towns will not grow if requirements are unfulfilled demanding requirements triggers a loss of approval are shifted by level one to be more demanding so uh, the less fulfilled your people are or if they lose fulfillment of goods they will quickly drop in approval rating and you'll start losing approval a lot faster or you can have tolerant which means you they give you a little bit of a leeway and they don't get as angry 
by needs not being fulfilled. The approval penalty right here kind of goes hand in hand with residential requirements. This just determines how much approval penalty you get for different factors, uh, such as residential requirements not being met, if there are dead bodies lying around, and several other factors that you will experience in game. Well placement, you either need to have wells placed on underground water sources that can be seen from the overlay map or unconstrained and you can place a well anywhere. This really doesn't matter. There's plenty of underground water. So I just leave this on by default and just go with it. And then there are weather events. If it rains and you have supplies sitting around, they could get destroyed by getting soaked. There's also droughts that can happen in the summer can, that can kill crops and fires can start by thunderstrikes. So you can have balanced weather events, difficult weather events, droughts happen in the summers, thunder strikes cause fires for sure, and rain instantly damages exposed supplies, or none. So three different choices for your weather events right there. So once you have your settings all set and you are happy with how it looks, then you are finally ready to click the begin button and get into game. All right, once you are in game, I definitely do recommend hitting pause or you can hit the space bar on your keyboard and that will pause the game. You want to take a little time at the very beginning to just look around at your current region and where it has put you at. We're starting over here in this province of uh, Zwayo. Zwayo? I can't pronounce that. I'm going to butcher these names. We start over here and we're going to be taking a look around the map and seeing what has generated for us. Now, this is called the early access map, so this map might change later on in the game. But for right now, this is what we are playing on. It is the same map every single time and the same layout of roads and forests and stuff. What changes, though, is resource layouts and resource placement, as well as fertilities. So if we take a look at our home region right here, we can see that we have a rich stone deposit and a rich iron deposit. Those are really, really good to have, as well as some wild animals up here, berries and a clay deposit. This is actually a really excellent starting location because we do have a lot of our resources right here clustered together. Very, very nice. We take a look at the region above us right here. We've got some, again, stone, iron, wild animals, clay deposits, but we also have a rich berry deposit. The resources, you'll always have all these exact same five resources. It just depends on if it's going to be a rich deposit or not and how much that deposit is going to have. So you'll take a look around and just kind of see what resources are available to you. That's going to be really important later on as you claim regions and decide how you want to kind of specialize those regions. A region like this with a, with the rich wild animal deposit, you might want to turn into a hunting area and kind of specialize it in hunting and gathering hides and meat and everything else like that to uh, barter and send back to your other regions for processing and to eat. This rich clay deposit right here would be an excellent source for having a clay tile maker over here to take all that clay and make it into clay tiles and everything else. And we can later on even put a deep clay mine on it where it will have endless supply of clay and turn this into a heavy manufacturing area. As far as our home region here, that rich iron deposit, again, we can put a deep mine on that and that's going to give us an endless supply of iron ore. So this would be a really good industrial area right here. So you really just kind of look around, see what's available to you, and kind of pre-plan what you might want to do with the different regions. Going along with that is going to be fertilities. So if we hit up the construction menu, this brings up our overlays. We can see here the underground water, which I was talking about. Again, plenty of underground water. Some of these other regions have lots and lots of underground water to them. So I'm not really concerned about where I place the underground water. There's going to be plenty of that. Now, emmer is going to be a really, really important one. Emmer is wheat. Wheat is used to make bread later on, and it's going to be a major source of food for you. Now, your starting region, the re whatever region you start in, the fertilities are randomized every time you restart, just like the resources. And your starting region is going to have, let's say, moderate fertility for emmer. It's this double plus, kind of means it's moderate. It's okay. It's not the best, but it's not the worst. The yellow means it's average, orange means it's poor, and red, which I don't, uh, yeah, now here's some red, but this double negative right here, this double negative means it is very, very poor. You basically won't grow anything there in terms of emmer. But you do have some okay spots right here, so we, maybe we can put an early farm, and we even have some triple right there. Ooh, we got some triple. That's rare to get that. It's very nice. Uh, but yeah, we could put some... Uh, early farms right here, just knowing that we're probably going to move them later and get some better fertility. 
as well as we have things like such as flax, barley, and then later on we can actually unlock access to rye through the technology tree and have rye, which is an alternative to emmer, and it can be grown in much less hospitable uh, soil, so it's really good later on. But looking outside of our particular region, you'll see that this region above us right here is just about all triple positive. It is really, really good. Flax is really good up there. Barley is really good. Rye is amazing. Pretty much this entire region is awesome for rye. So you'll usually have a neighboring region next to yours that's going to have absolutely amazing fertility. What you'll probably end up wanting to do is turn that into more of a farming focused region and use the bartering system to send food and grains, uh, ale, things like that back to your other regions and make this like a bread basket right up here. So this is going to be an excellent bread basket region right here with all that fertility. All right, we've taken a look around the map. We kind of know what's going on. We know where everything's at and kind of planned out our later expansions. We know what resources are available to us. We're ready to start building finally. So what do we want to build? Well, we're going to go under construction and we're going to go under the gathering tab right here. And there are four things you want to build first. A logging camp, a woodcutter's lodge, a hunting camp, as well as a forager hut. I would build these four guys first and immediately. Timber is being produced by the logging camp, which you need to construct buildings with. The woodcutter's lodge gives you firewood. The hunting camp obviously gives you meat and hides and the forager hut gives you berries. So we're gonna go ahead and place these down. I know I'm probably gonna put my town right around in here somewhere. So I kind of want everything somewhat close. So we're gonna put that logging camp right there. Now the Woodcutter's Lodge is a little different from other games you might have played. It doesn't actually take timber from the uh, logging camp. It actually chops trees on its own. So you want to place it up further away from your logging camp. So they kind of have their own areas to go and log in. You don't really want them to uh, be taking up timber from the same spots or you'll kind of clear cut and run out of trees really quick in that area. So we're just going to build that right there. Now, the hunting camp, you do want to place that somewhat close to your animals. And our animals are right up there. So we're going to put that hunting camp right there. We're going to put that forager hut right next to it and kind of have our little food gathering area. Let me go ahead and connect up some roads to all of this. And we're going to let our people, we're going to unpause the game. I'm going to triple fast forward this thing or times 12 and let our people get started building these first few buildings. All right, as your people are building these, make sure you're going in and starting to assign. You just want to assign one family. Remember, you're not assigning actual people to these slots. You're assigning families to them. And the families, the, usually the husbands and sons will go off and do a lot of the work, while the wives and daughters may work at the market or go and get different materials. So just go through everything as it's being constructed and assign a family to them. That leaves us one unassigned family, and that one unassigned family we want to keep because they are going to be the ones that are going to do construction for us. So we've got that right there built. We did see a pop-up right there that said that our people are looking for a marketplace, so we definitely want to go ahead and pop that down. Now the marketplace is pretty important. Uh, you want to put that somewhere that's going to be kind of a central area of your village. And you're going to end up kind of building your village around that. When you're laying out your market, I would start with maybe around 20 or so uh, plots, uh, somewhere around 20. You want to make sure it's big enough because it's going to need a lot of space in it because you're going to have a lot of market stalls. What I like to do is go ahead and surround that with roads and make that just kind of like a town square, basically. It doesn't require any material, so once you plop it down, it is there. And then people will come and start constructing their stalls once they have some free time. Now, once you have all of that built, what you want to do is, depending on how many resources you started with, depending on your settings, you want to save up 14 timber. The 14 timber is going to be used to build your first houses, or in this game, they are called burgages. So you want to save up 14 timber because we are going to build seven of them to start. Okay, once you have your 14 timber available, we'll go ahead and start laying out these burgage plots. Now, burgage plots are really kind of fun to actually lay out. You can you can kind of have a lot of fun with these. As you can see, it uses that flexible system where you lay down points to determine where you want them. So I could do something like this and create some really wild looking, very interesting designs and everything. 
or you could just be really simple about it and just make it like that and boom, easy and done. But now when you're laying these out, the way you want to lay them out is this right here is just going to be the house. Okay, that little symbol in the middle just means that it's going to get four houses right there. What I recommend doing is getting them just a little bit bigger to where you see that symbol in the back. Okay, that symbol back there means that it's going to have a backyard extension and those are going to be really important. You can do all kinds of stuff with the backyard extensions. You can put animals on them, have vegetable farms. Later on, you can turn them into artists and workshops. So you want to make sure you have backyard extensions. One of the other really important things for the backyard extension uh, is that vegetable farm. Now, vegetable farms need quite a bit of room, as you would imagine, from an actual farm. This right here would actually be a great burgage plot, even though it's just two. That backyard extension right there is really big, and it would give me a really nice vegetable farm. So I'm going to go ahead and build that one. Now here's another interesting design right here for burgage plots that you could do. You see the house icon, we see the backyard extension icon. There's two other icons right there, and that one on the side has a plus next to it, means that it's going to actually be able to have a second house built on the plot and another family could live there. So even though it's just two plots, we can fit four families right there. So that would save us building material and a little bit of space. This is actually good for if ones you're not wanting to turn into um, maybe artisans later and maybe just use them as actual like, you know, far, like small farms or chicken coops or goats or something. So that would be a good use for that. Now, while that's being built, something really, really important you might want to go ahead and start doing is laying out some road networks. Roads don't cost anything to build. So it's really, really good to kind of go ahead and get an idea of where you want your road network to be so you don't accidentally like you know, cause yourself trouble later on and you've like kind of built yourself into a corner or something, go ahead and just kind of plan out some basic roads and everything. They don't have to stay there. And with the way the building system in this game works, it's okay to have kind of wild, crazy roads because most everything can be built to suit around your wild, crazy road network. This is just going to really help you in the long run as to where you need everything and where you might want to leave a little bit of space later. All right, we've got a couple of burgage plots down. Let's quickly take a look at the UI for the housing and what you need to know about this. So this right here shows you the amenities and the market supply that they need to upgrade to level two. All right, so they're going to need water, a church, at least one type of fuel, two types of food, and clothing, which can be supplied by linen, leather, or yarn. That's going to allow them to upgrade to the second burgage plot. Those are pretty easy to fulfill, and we'll get that done by the end of this video. While your houses are being built, you probably also want to go ahead and place down a couple more things that they're going to need early on. The well, they will need drinking water. The well doesn't have to be directly next to the people, although you don't want it too, too far away. I probably could have built the town a little bit more over this way, closer to the water source, but it's perfectly okay. I could put that well actually right there and it will be fine and they can get some water when they're done with work and things like that. One other thing that's pretty important to build early on that a lot of people don't even talk about is having a secondary hitching post. Hitching posts are really important to be moving materials around. So you want to go ahead and get another one of those. I'm going to place this one over here near my logging camp. And then this one right here will give us an additional oxen that I can use to move goods around. And don't forget, you also start with a hitching post and you also want to get that and relocate it and move that one in closer to town as well. That way you have extra, that way their ox doesn't have to go so far from hitching post to where the rest of your uh, actual resources are. So we'll go ahead and move that hitching post closer into town as well. Right here is not a bad idea because a lot of the work of the ox early on is from the logging camp and you can move these around really, really easily. While we're waiting for those last two families to come in and fill up our burgers plots, there's a couple of other really important buildings that we need to get. We see that we have some exposed goods and we need a storehouse. So we need to get that storehouse built so we can have our goods stored somewhere and not out in the open. Up here is a pretty decent spot next to this logging camp. And we also need a granary. Granary, again, very important. It's going to keep all of our food nice and dry. And I think over here would be a great spot for that. Now, if you have the option whenever you build the storehouse and have five houses to get the armaments, you will get a message and you'll get the armament delivery quest. Go ahead and grab that and you will get 20 spears and 20 large shields. 
We'll click on Army. We'll click on Create New Unit. And we're going to go ahead and click Create the Militia Spear. And it will start filling up with uh, male citizens up to 20. As you build up your city, you're going to unlock your first development point. Now, wherever you, where you spend your development point is kind of up to you. I definitely recommend thinking about your current region and what sort of rich deposits are in it. If you're in a region that has a rich wild animal deposit, you might want to go trapping. That way you can also eventually go to advanced skinning to double the amount of meat harvested by hunters and butchers and from goat pens as well as pelt extraction so you get more hides from the actual traps right here. This is going to give you a lot of food from those rich animal deposits. You have a rich berry deposit, you could go double capacity for all berries. So there are some really good ones. You could go apiaries for more honey, which leads into advanced beekeeping to get wax for candles. One really good path you might want to go in your starting region is actually up towards rye. Go through orchards and then go up to rye cultivation. That's going to unlock the rye fertility, and that's going to let you start making wheat really early on in your starting region without having to go to a neighboring region to get those goods and have them sent back and having to barter for your food. So I would honestly probably go that upper route right there towards rye, but you really could go any which way you want. Uh, you could go down towards deep mining through the charcoal burning to gain access to the deep mines for iron or clay. Uh, you could go over th this side over here isn't really important. Um, you know, it's all about trade and everything. The foreign supplies is not bad, uh, but you do need to be producing regional wealth because it does cost money to have these uh, constant supplies of goods brought in. So I wouldn't necessarily go this route early game. I would either go farming or go over here if you want to. But I'm going to go towards the farming route because I want that rye cultivation pretty quickly. So we've got our storehouse built and we're getting goods brought into that. We have our granary and it's going to start bringing in food and everything else and start storing all of that. But as you can see, we only have 250 storage in these things. So that's not a lot. The granary does have 500, but yeah, it's just not a lot of storage space. So we can expand these to a large. It's going to give us 2,500 generic storage and 2,500 pantry storage. Really, really great, but we need planks. So our next goal is to build some more burgage plots, get some more people into the city that are be unassigned, because we need to go in and we need to build a saw pit for planks out of timber. And we also are going to need a tannery, which is going to allow us to produce leather from the hides that we're getting from the hunting lodge. And that's going to supply the clothing need and give us almost everything we need to upgrade our burgage plots to level two. Now, once you have your saw pit, make sure you go under construction reserve and reserve timber for construction. If not, your saw pit will take all of the timber it can get and turn it into uh, planks and you don't want that you'd still need timber for building other stuff so i like to set mine for about 20 you can set that to whatever you are comfortable with all right and the last thing we're going to have is the church now i was hoping to have it a I, I probably should have made this thing a little bit wider and i could have put him in the middle but that's okay i can fit him right here actually and it'll be perfectly fine so we're going to plop down that church right there and that's going to give us the last thing that we need to upgrade all of our people into level twos now, level two burgage plots will start generating one regional wealth per family per month. And so that's going to start giving us some money income finally that we can use for upgrading things. Now, while that's all happening, you probably should by now already have your 20 out of 36 militia. And you've probably been getting raided by bandits if you have that enabled. Just zoom out, find where those bandits are. I see them right over there. We're going to gather our spear militia up and we're going to rally them together right over here on the border of our land and then we're going to send them out to go and attack those bandits raiding bandits is really important because for clearing bandit camps you do gain influence and you need influence to claim other regions on the map so be sure you are taking care of bandits and fighting them the brigands are pretty pretty weak overall so you shouldn't have too hard of a time taking them out early on as you can see, we are winning pretty handily. We've already taken out several of their number. We haven't taken any casualties ourselves. We are at only 39% effectiveness, and that is because I did run them over. Ideally, you should walk your army everywhere that they go, so their fatigue does not go down, and that makes them a little bit more effective in combat. 
Once you take out enough of them, they will scatter and run. And then all you got to do is go over here and right click, right click the bandit camp. And you will go and start gaining resources from them. As you can see, taking out that bandit army gave us 320 influence. You need a thousand to claim a region. So we are well on our way to having enough influence to claim our first region. Once you claim a bandit camp, you'll get this pop-up right here. You can either send the money to yourself or to the nearest town. I do recommend sending it to the nearest town at first because, again, you do have a spear militia. They're going to be enough to take on bandits for a little while, and you could use the resources in your village. Once that is done, you want to make sure you send your people back. Run them if necessary because you want to disband them. Don't forget, once you get your men back within your territory, to disband them. And then go ahead and disband unit. That will put everybody back to work. I have more than once left my guys standing around and wondering why nothing was happening in my village. All right. And with the church built, you are now ready to upgrade your people to level two. Ready to start generating that wealth, moving into the artisan stuff and getting a lot more advanced village going on than we currently have with our simple little settlement right here. But guys, I think this right here is an excellent start. The city... The village looks wonderful. It's absolutely beautiful, and I can't wait to expand it even further. I hope this video gave you some ideas and some tips and tricks and kind of just how to get started in Manor Lords. Again, this is an early access preview. Some things may change by early access release, and if you're watching this later on down the road, some mechanics may have changed as well. Be sure to check out my channel for any updated videos or guides later on down the road. If you are watching this early on in early access, again, check my channel out for more videos for early access content and anything else I can throw at you guys. Let me know down below what you might want to see. And until the next one, take care.